London is still a city of villages. Dorothea White works in one of them. She's a printer. She left art school and borrowed 750 pounds from her back, bought a hand press, and set up a business called Studio Prints. It began in a basement, and then moved into a grocer's shop, Sainsbury's first country branch, in Queen's Crescent, Kentish Town. Dürer, Rembrandt, Goya and Picasso all did some of their greatest work in the form of artist prints. Any phone calls, Tad? Yeah, Tony Gross rang to see how we're getting on. Tony, Anthony Gross, has been famous as an engraver and etcher for more than 40 years. He taught Dorothea at the Slade School of Art. The black isn't overprinting the pink. Three other young people work with Dorothea and share the responsibilities of running an atelier like this. Francis and Claire Miller was also a student of the slave. Gary Kennard avoided art schools altogether. He'd always wanted to be an artist, and before this job came along, he did odds and ends, such as cleaning, for a living. Christopher Penny studied art at Bournemouth. He didn't want to be a teacher, and all four of them had their own reasons for wanting to do printing rather than anything else. I wanted to do a job that was um, not teaching or anything like that, where you were sort of pretty independent and still working on something sort of faintly like art. I've never done any etching printing before. And... Um... They've been teaching me ever since I came here. When I came to London, I did the usual sort of apres college thing of going on the dole for three months. I wanted to get a job of some sort involved in the arts, but not really in commercial art, because it, one has heard that it's such a sort of rat race. I think it's terribly important that the artist should be involved as much as we are, because if he wants to have prints, as he would have liked to have done them himself, he's got to come in and work with us, particularly at the beginning. The word print is confusing. Artist prints are proofed and signed individually. They're not copies or reproductions of anything created in another medium, such as watercolour or oils. They are original works drawn by the artist directly onto a woodblock, a metal plate or a stone, and use materials and techniques only appropriate to printing. In an atelier such as studio prints, the printers, being artists themselves, have a special sympathy and feeling for the qualities that other artists wish to achieve in the prints that they run off for them. This is a woodblock by Gary Kennard. It looks like a negative because the parts that have been cut away will show white on the paper. The ink is taken only off the surface and by using gentle pressures and soft papers, he's able to get a great range of textures and tones out of the wood itself. Frances and Claire Miller likes landscapes and strong colours. She brushes a sugar solution onto the plate under the etching ground. She uses two plates inked in different colours, which are printed in register to make the final picture. Christopher Penny uses an aquatint process, but in this case, he first engraved lines on the plate. The result is a single impression taken at one printing. He calls it Desolation Row. Dorothea also made her print in a single process but cut the plate into two parts. In the press, the paper was forced into the gap between the two pieces, leaving a white line in high relief. For six months, they've been helping to print a book, a very special edition of poems by Theocritus, a Sicilian poet of the third century BC. The idea started with the book lover, publisher and radio producer, Douglas Cleverdon. This started about two years ago when I saw an exhibition of the work of Anthony Gross. 
which included some enchanting etchings of dryads, you know, wood nymphs coming out of the trees. And I thought this would be a superb uh, artist to illustrate the possible poet like Theocritus. So I looked through various translations and I couldn't find anything really exciting until I uh, came across uh, an Elizabethan translation uh, which was published in 1588 which is a single copy in the Bodleian. And I showed these uh, translations to Tony Gross and he was very enthusiastic about them. So we commissioned him to do uh, seven etchings for the six idylls. And uh, th that's what he's now working on. An etching is made by covering a highly polished copper plate with a darkened adhesive ground, through which the artist draws his design. He can use a number of traditional tools for this purpose. The stippling needle is one. Then there's a kind of small milled wheel on a shaft, which is called the roulette. Gross uses all kinds of things, even old doorknobs. He's also very fond of the tool called the mezzotint rocker, a kind of chisel with a serrated edge that scrapes dozens of thin parallel lines through the etching ground. The subject of this plate is Hiero, king of Syracuse, leading his men into battle on horseback. At this stage, the finished design looks like a photographer's negative. The plate is covered in a mass of minute markings which will print in reverse an astonishing variety of detail, tone and texture. The plate goes into a bath of nitric acid, which slowly eats into the copper markings. Bubbles of gas form, and these are wiped away with a traditional acid-proof goose feather. Success or failure depends on correctly judging the depth of the bite. When the shallowest part of the design has been bitten deeply enough, the plate is taken out, and that part is stopped with an acid resistant. The plate then goes back into the bath so that other parts can be bitten more deeply. The deeper the bite, the blacker the print will be. The printing itself needs just as much care at every stage in the process. It's very important to damp the paper because it goes under such pressure in the press of at least 200 pounds per square inch and it has to expand over the plate and if it was dry it would crease. Um, also it needs to be able to get down into the deepest lines to pick up the black ink. After putting it in the bath and stacking it, we leave it overnight so that the water can gradually soak through into each sheet under weight. And by the time we start in the morning, it's ready to use. We draw the shape of the plate, the edges of the paper in relation to the, the text. It's not always possible to get the registration absolutely accurate because of the expansion of the paper. The inks are powder pigments for intaglio printing. One mixes them with oils. Having got it to a sort of paste, one then grinds it with a, a muller, which will take out all the little grains and bits of grit and make it into a very creamy consistency. The ink is pushed into all the lines all over the plate and then once you've got all the ink into the plate, one wipes the surface with muslins. When it's practically clean, you then wipe it with your hand, which is a sort of an action rather like wiping breadcrumbs off a table, so that you polish the top surfaces, leaving the ink in the lines. Once you've got the uh, plate laid on its register marks, you then take the paper and lay it upside down onto the plate. 
As it goes under the roller, it's squeezed down into the lines and also squeezed over the edges of the plate. It actually can expand up to half an inch. And then we use a backing sheet, which helps um, get a lot more pressure just on the, on the lines themselves. And then one pulls over the blankets. They're not ordinary blankets, they're rather like felt, so that one doesn't have any marks coming through onto the print. It doesn't really matter what speed one turns the plate through at, but it's very important that one should be able to feel the pressure. One gets so used to it, you can tell whether there's enough pressure or not enough immediately. When you pull the print off the plate, it's very important to take it off slowly from one edge so that the ink comes out of the line slowly and, and in fact one gets the most ink out that one possibly can. If you take it off too quickly, some of the ink might get left in the lines. One's looking for things like uh, lines which haven't printed, which on this book that we're doing, there are a tremendous amount of fine lines, which if the ink is the wrong consistency or if the temperature of the day is wrong or if the paper is too wet, some of these lines won't print. Gross's etchings are added to sheets of text that have already been printed in Cambridge by Will Carter. A job like this is done by contract. The publisher is quoted a price per print, which works out at a few shillings each. The complete book handmade at every stage will be sold in an edition of 200 at about 30 pounds each. A further 100 copies, with each etching signed by the artist, will sell at about 60 pounds per book. Then for the connoisseur, there'll be eight very special copies with an extra set of etchings costing about 170 pounds per set. Is that all right? Mm. That line's all right now, isn't That's it? That's better, yep. Nice, that's nice through there. You dragged it. Just about right. That's good. What about this up here? No, oh, I think that's up in a bit of a hurry. It may seem a lot to pay for a book, but then this edition of Theocritus will have been felt, touched and smelled by artists and craftsmen from beginning to end. There's a price to pay for that. For the printers, it's paid in blood, sweat and toil. 4,000 times before the edition is complete. I'd like to keep studio prints going. I don't know whether I'd... I wouldn't want to be doing as much printing as I'm doing now for the rest of my life. But I'd like to think that it would keep going and that one would have more time to do one's own work. I love everything to do with the medium, the actual sort of biting of a plate, you know, the bubbles coming off the plate and the acid. I find absolutely fascinating. I like to take a raw material and mould it so that the finished result not only has my stamp on it, but also still retains the stamp of the material it's made from. It'd be nice if we didn't have to actually print so much, you know, get someone else to turn the wheel. These days, we throw away most of the words and pictures that we buy. We don't care for images much. You cannot feel a television picture in your hand. Communication comes through dead things, which only come to life when you switch them on. A fine print is something lasting, tangible, and a work of art that is constantly alive.